We're going to do a great show today, and we're going to help people because we're good enough and we're lawful enough. And doggone it, people like us. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim. And today we're going to do a special show, one that deserves more than just a line meant for a cheap laugh. So let's get to it on WebDM. All right, Jim, now that the stars have aligned, let's talk about alignment once again. Everyone's favorite topic to argue about in Dungeons and Dragons, alignment. Does it really matter in fifth edition? I mean, first off, first off they've, you know, they've removed so many spells and abilities and, and class features yeah. and everything that sort of deal with alignment that alignment is now almost like the color of your character's hair, yeah. their sort of physical features. Um, you say it once right at the beginning of, uh, of the game and then you have to remind people <laughs> later. Remind people later. And I think that's probably ultimately a good thing. I like alignment. Mm -hmm. I like the, the whether it's the sort of the dichotomy between law and chaos or sort of the, the nine alignment structure. Right. I, I liked it, but I I do recognize and see that it has been uh, used too often to sort of put players in a straight jacket. So I think overall the hobby is better with alignment being just a, a character, one of many characteristics that doesn't have mechanical weight to it. Mm -hmm. But I do like the concept and idea behind alignment. There's just a lot of fun things you can do with it, I think. Well, we are humans and we love contradictory behavior and, sure. and you know, stuff like that. So. I embrace my contradictions. Oh, well, why not? Well, of course. <laughs> so what do you think it is about alignment? alignment that doesn't work and what does work mm -hmm. about it. I think what doesn't work about it is when it's used to hamper or or browbeat the players. Yeah. And be like, well, you know, no, you wrote down this particular <clears throat> alignment uh, or you know or you know you cannot do this thing because of what your alignment says. Right. And when it's it, when it's used in a prescriptive manner as opposed to just sort of describe the character's personality and, and sort of morality. I think it works best when alignment is adherence to a cosmic allegiance that exists within the D&D multiverse. And your character by by acting in a certain way or or even outright pledging allegiance to a particular alignment plants their flag for a particular side in the cosmic struggle for for balance in D&D. Right. And when it when it gets down to just sort of alignment as personal morality, that's that's where I find it breaks down because there's so much kind of relativism that creeps in what's good, what's evil. I mean, just mm -hmm. witness the debates when when I said something that raising dead, raising the dead, animating corpses for for use is an evil act. And there are so many people who, number one, conflated the animating corpses and creating zombies with necromancy as a whole, right. not the same. And and then also just like the idea that animating the dead and creating zombies and, and, and ghouls and ghosts and things was an evil act. There was a lot of people who were like, no, it's not. They don't have to be. In base D&D, it creates an evil creature. And I see that as an evil act. Well, if you bring evil into the world, aren't you an orchestrator of evil. Right, even if you do something good with it, yeah. uh, you know, you are bringing an evil thing into the world that previously didn't exist. And so I think that when you get down to sort of the, the relativism of personal morality, whether an individual act is good or not, uh, is where alignment starts to break down. But right. if you take them as cosmic allegiances, that law and good mean something objectively, that makes it very different from our own world, right? A lot of different interpretations of morality, what's good, what's not. One person's good is another person's not. Yeah. In Dungeons & Dragons, it's different. You can know what is good. There are gods who will come and tell you. It used to be spells that would confirm and abilities <laughs> and things. <laughs> I'm gonna cast this spell to make sure you're good. You know, those questions I found interesting. I'm. I'm of a philosophical mind. I like those kind of questions outside of Dungeons and Dragons. And so yeah. having them in there, I thought added a richness and, and depth to the game. But I do recognize that it was a problem for a lot of people. And so it's it's best it's best if, if it's an opt-in kind of thing. The default yeah. assumption is that alignment doesn't really matter, that it's another characteristic of your character. If the DM wants to make it matter more, have it be something more, um, a, a deeper part of their world, they can. But unlike past editions where alignment really mattered and had a, and played a bigger role, I think there are a lot of people they, they had problems with that. In fifth edition, they kind of moved on from alignment to as describing your character to your traits, bonds, flaws, and all that. Like, how do you find that in relation to just an alignment to 
to prescribe how you're supposed to play your character. Right, you're talking about like the personality traits yeah. that come with background. I think those are a better example of like fleshing out your character and and sort of adding depth to it than trying to figure out exactly like what your alignment is and, and how it. How yeah, it trying to see what lawful good looks like. <laughs> the number of arguments and people who insist that lawful good is this way or lawful good is another way or, or any of the other alignments. This is something again. If you're gonna feature alignment in your game. Mm -hmm. Hash it out in section zero. What does it mean? Right, right. I've always been a fan of saying like, well, your alignment is based on your actions as character. You can write down whatever you want in that box next to mm -hmm. alignment. But if your actions as a player differ from that, then that that number, or that not that number, but that value that you wrote down is meaningless. If you say that you were chaotic good and then consistently act in a manner that's more appropriate for neutral evil. Yeah. Then you're neutral evil, and I think some players take take exception to that and say, "No, I wrote this down on my character sheet. You can't change it." Yeah. Or if you're a lawful good paladin who constantly does things, <laughs> constantly does things unpaladin. -like. You know, hi, this is my friend. You know. Right, and this is why I think the oaths for paladins are are are, are a good development on that. Yeah. Moving away from as much as I love the classic lawful good paladin, and 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 they really hold a special place for me. The fact that there are now oaths that say, okay, here are the tenets that you must mm -hmm. abide by and act by. I find that more uh, flexible and more interesting than yeah. than sort of like arguing over what lawful good means. The laws of man and the laws of nature are mm -hmm. different, which is why it's good to have nature bound paladin right. now, and yeah. then you. Also have like the, the one of, of vengeance, right, uh, right? Or whatever it is, vengeance. Um, yeah, no, it's vengeance. I, vengeance. I haven't played Paladin yet. I need right. to. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I like that it distinguishes it in the oath. Like what this it, is the means. particular law right. that you fight right. for the good of, right? right? Yeah. So like in previous editions, alignment played a ton of stuff. There were alignment restrictions on uh, cl certain classes, mm -hmm. certain features. There were spells that impacted alignment or at least let you detect them. Uh, alignment languages were another one that people yeah. had kind of difficulty wrapping their head around. I sort of saw them as more like, well, if you see alignment as cosmic, as you sided with a certain, uh, you know, multiverse spanning side in a, in a conflict, then the alignment language makes more sense. That's the, that's the language that people on that side look like. And of course, alignment languages were really in there when there were just like three or four alignments, like neutral, yeah. chaotic, and law. And then it wasn't until they start branching out and adding more, and then they got the ninefold grid. Yeah, what does the language of evil look like? Does it have to be written in I mean, blood? It's, it's, the, it's the language of Mordor. It's yeah. the black speech. Uh, yeah. What does the language of good look like? It's Enochian. It's the language of angels. Yeah. And, and so in some ways, things like infernal and abyssal and celestial and primordial replace those kinds of languages yeah um, but I, that's how I always kind of saw it was just it, it's a it's a language for people who belong to this side of the conflict that they share yeah. in common with one another and, and yeah. usually it was just something that clerics had to worry about how do you make alignment matter again <laughs> hashtag mama no right <laughs> <laughs> and is it worth it? Is it worth it? I think that it's worth it if it's if you're running a classic Great Wheel planar campaign. If you're mm -hmm. going to use the default assumptions about the the Dungeons and Dragons cosmology with different gods that rep, that have alignments that they that they belong to and different planes that correspond with those alignments, then it's worthwhile to say, okay, you know, if you are a chaotic neutral kind of person. And that's your demeanor. That's that's the side you have chosen, and a personality that reflects that. Then traveling to lawful planes is going to be more difficult for you. Mm -hmm. and, and and a lot of that there doesn't necessarily need to be game mechanics associated with it. It's more of a player buy-in, yeah. and getting players and dungeon masters on the same page that says, okay, I want alignment to matter in my game because I am using these elements of Dungeons and Dragons where alignment is sort of the foundation for it. The Great Wheel cosmology, the way that gods work, and how they draw power from the prime material plane and what they do with petitioners uh, after they after they're dead and sort of what their home domains are like like all of that alignment's really kind of baked into it I can't imagine running a planescape campaign where alignment didn't matter right right it's it's particularly capital P planescape not just a planar campaign yeah yeah but one where the factions are present and and the the cosmic struggle that goes on in the great wheel is is central focus of that game that's a kind of campaign I would want alignment to really matter yeah I mean it could be something as simple as like I'm chaotic good but you're on one of the lawful planes like it could be a thing where maybe every now and again you maybe have to do like a constitution check because being here is a little bit tough on you and you might incur a level of exhaustion. Or something or, like that, yeah. Particularly or, on those planes where you're really 
like you're the, diametrically opposed. You're diametrically opposed, and I do think that maybe something like that, where there's a level of exhaustion or it, it makes makes things more difficult uh, overall, is a good way to sort of mechanically reinforce that. I would start personally with just sort of player buy-in and saying like, "Hey guys, this is going to be in, this is going to be important and relevant to our our campaign." At the same time, I, I think that one of the best things that came out of 4th edition was the unaligned alignment. And I yeah, think that probably un most people and most creatures and things, not just neutral, neutral is they position. You have taken... It's the agnostic of alignments. Right, but you have said, I'm, I'm committed to, to, to sort of a, a militant neutrality yeah. <laughs> in this case. Uh, unaligned is just like, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. So for the atheist, right? And it's just kind of like, oh, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not. I don't have a. I don't have a, a horse in this race. So I, I think unaligned is something that uh, if you're going to use alignments, that, then it's worthwhile. Sort of like as a tenth alignment. I don't know. There's so much about the concept of alignment that the it's <clears throat> one of those that the further we get away from, get away from Dungeons and Dragons roots, the more and more it sticks out as a as a vestigial thing. Yeah, it's just around kind of for legacy reasons and not so much. Yeah, so so you know. does that mean it's destined just to end up in the appendix of the books? I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> you know, you could you could ignore it completely. And yeah. for my thing, as much as I like alignment, as much as I enjoy the concept of it, most of my campaigns, you know, I completely ignore it. Right. It's it, it's never brought up. It's never referenced. And I've done that for years. In third yeah. edition, I changed most of the alignment stuff to be like instead of protection from evil, good, chaos, law. It was like protection from outsiders, undead, fey, and something else. I forget what the other one was. So you were just getting ahead of what they did in fifth edition. Yeah, it really right. was. And so when I saw that how they how they did it in fifth edition, both with like the paladins detect evil feature and the way protection from evil works. Now I was like, oh, that's great. You know, I've been running that way for like ten years. Um, They're and, watching you, Jim Davis. I don't know about that, but. Uh, uh, they're certainly uh, kind of uh, <laughs> they're certainly on the same wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> Something that that doesn't really happen anymore doesn't I guess it doesn't really matter. Uh, but what was one of my favorite parts of playing like in second edition mm -hmm. was the alignment change. God. Having to worry about changing alignments and right. what does that mean? What does you that could, mean? You could put on a helm of opposite alignment and you're chaotic good right. you know <laughs> fighter a becomes evil. a lawful evil <laughs> right you know i mean there were voluntary alignment changes that carried with them some pretty stiff penalties um and then there were involuntary alignment uh, penalty uh, changes that could also come with their own penalties i don't know this is one of those areas where switching alignments and the penalties that were associated with them like doing going so far as to be like you no longer gain levels for a while or you mm -hmm. don't get experience points or things like yeah. that where what it was kind of like why such why was it so harsh? You're going through an existential crisis, Jim Davis. Everything I mean, you knew fell apart. I, th I think that's if if you take alignment, alignment has to be more than just sort of a personality yeah. or or an idea of a vague sense of morality for it to be like that. Yeah. It has to be something that's central to your core. Uh, right. in a way that goes beyond and deeper than just personality or, or morality. And that's why I think like having it be that there are, in a typical D&D world with, the, with a basic cosmology, there are f things out there, there are entities that represent these alignments and they are in conflict with each other. And if you belong to one of those, let's say you're a cleric or a paladin or someone who just feels strongly and they tie that stake in it, then switching allegiances would carry with them I don't know a penalty enough that you don't no longer gain levels <laughs> or yeah. have to wait a certain period before you can uh, start gaining levels again. I think that those are things that need to be role played out. Yes. And some groups are just not going to be into that. Yeah. They're just not going to care. They don't want to worry about it. And I'm not talking about like murder hobo sort of like we're just going to kick in the door and kill everything kind of groups. But there are groups where they, they want to talk about and explore other possibilities for their characters mm -hmm. as, as opposed to this. So yeah, the, the penalties for alignment switching were one of those things where I was like, I think that's where a lot of this kind of distaste and, and, and lack of really liking alignments came out. I guess the other one would be DMs who used alignment as a straight jacket for their players. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was the tripwire, the noose and everything. So you just didn't want to do anything with it. Didn't want to mess with it. So because everybody it would, was yeah, they don't want their characters fucked with. Right, and everybody now everybody's suddenly chaotic because they don't want to have to worry about breaking the law and they don't want to have to worry about doing this and that. You know, in our experience, like I, I've only had one character that had an alignment shift. Right, but 
And you put on a ring that has a demon prince in it, and he forces you to go kill a bunch of people to do a pointless task just for his amusement. Right. At the end of that, uh huh. I think what was I? I was I was was I chaotic evil or lawful evil? I can't remember. I don't remember. I think, I think it was sure chaotic I evil. Yeah. We're pretty chaotic and evil. In yeah, because I swung around. Because I, I think I started as chaotic good or neutral good, uh -huh. and I ended chaotic evil. Right. And then I had to atone mm -hmm. and became a paladin. Right. And switch back. To, went from chaotic evil to lawful good. <laughs> Right, you to like you know, being possession by a ghost or a demon, uh, cursed items. Those are all things that can that can change your character. I would do them now by introducing new personality traits, as opposed to an alignment change. I would say, okay, you have this flaw now. Yeah. You have this bond now. Now there's a mechanic type to it. Player characters can get inspiration by playing to those flaws, and and even if they're negative personality traits, yeah. as suffering multiple demonic possessions or long-term demonic possessions might bring with it a whole host of new ideals, beliefs, bonds, flaws, mm -hmm. everything, personality trait maybe, along with a, a switch in alignment that is, is largely toothless now, but still sort of symbolic. Why don't we go through a couple of, uh, a couple of examples of a alignment. classic game the, of, of D and Ders everywhere. Yeah, is who, who is what alignment? Who is what alignment, Jim Davis? <laughs> right. My favorite, of course. Anybody, long time viewers of the show, know that I love Dread, and Dread yeah. to me is the epitome of lawful neutral. Yeah, like the law is the law. You know, I know that I've seen some people say that Dread is more lawful evil. Maybe he is in the comics. I've, I've never read any any of those. I've only really seen the, he's, the two he's, movies. He's a pretty big asshole. You've mentioned this as well as the scene in in the Dread movie where he's like, "You're going to want to get out of here." Like, I could shoot you for this vagrancy. Oh, no, no, yeah, the, hom the homeless guy that's sitting underneath the door, and he's like, hey, that's vagrancy, it's two weeks in the cubes, don't be here when we get back. Don't be here when we get he back. He let a guy off the hook. I mean, this is just movies. Right. But he let a guy off the hook for a short time. He tried to warn him, and of right. course the guy died. Right, but otherwise, you know, Judge Dredd is, is a, is judge, jury, and executioner. He is the law. And you can sort of see that in terms of like how certain people play the paladin. Yeah. And right, like there are people who play the paladin is just that I'm here to impose my will on other people. Mm -hmm. it, it's really when that gets to be, you know, one player imposing a particular play style on the other char player characters that it's just kind of like, you gotta, you gotta boot that. You either need to talk to that player or kick him out of your group. Yeah, the grand, the grand old paladin rogue in the same party uh, right. dynamic. The classic, classic paladin rogue, uh, you know. And, but at the same time, paladins were people who played paladins. And there was a lot of, I mean, now they're in older editions of D&D, they're kind of a munchkin class. They've got a lot of benefits going for them. You had to roll particularly well or have a certain set of stats. But they also had some pretty harsh, you cannot adventure with evil. And, or you knowingly, every, or now you're just a shitty fighter. Yeah, yeah, you lose it all just <laughs> right. because you, yeah, you hung out with that one guy for two weeks. Yeah, and so you really kind of force the player of the paladin to become a jerk about what the other players are doing at the table because of the way the paladin kind of works. Mm -hmm. and I really kind of think if that's the kind of paladin you're playing, where you're you're you cannot knowingly. Uh, adventure or, or associate with evil party members or creatures mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, that's kind of something you need to talk about at the beginning of the campaign. What does it mean? How's this going to work? Um, I don't think Devotion Paladin is that uh, strict anymore, no. but well, it, getting back to Dread, it, it's, it's, he, that's the kind of thing, right? He's, uh, he upholds the law and, and yeah. where he treads, he is the law and, and, and is able to break it. Mm -hmm. in the pursuit of his duties because it's impossible for him to not break the law, if that makes sense. Right, well, he can't. Because, right. Because then it, the law, law means nothing. Right. If, if, the, if the guy who is the law is breaking the law, then, right. and that's then why society doesn't that, exist. And that's why it's terrifying, because you don't want people who are meant to uphold the law and enforce it to be able to break it uh, at, at will. That's a kind of a terrifying uh, thing, which is, I think, probably what the comic book is getting at. Uh, oh, no, it's the whole point. It's, fat, <laughs> fat, it's the police state and fact. Fascism taken to its nth degree. <laughs> right. I mean, right. um, so but dread, to, to dread go, lawful neutral, uh -huh. lawful lawful neutral. But to go back to your the the way a paladin can be presented, like one of the one of the age old the the champion for justice and right, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. maybe doesn't do it the way you'd think. Yeah, Batman. Ba talking about Batman. Batman. What alignment is what Batman? alignment is Batman? Jim I have Davis. seen Batman all over the place, like whether he's chaotic good, whether he's lawful good, lawful evil sometimes. Of course, a lot of it depends on who's writing. And my favorite Batman 
the, to me, the definitive Batman ever full stop is the animated series Batman. Yeah. I, I find that it that struck a good balance between Batman the Dark Avenger, the, the, the <clears throat> Dark Knight, mm-hmm. and Bruce Wayne, the philanthropist who cares about Gotham, cares about his community. Bruce Wayne is a it seems to have adjusted to his life as a vigilante that... Yeah, he's that, not crazy. Right. <laughs> it's, some, it's somewhere along the line, like, Batman became this, like, tortured, dark... I mean, like somewhere, I mean, uh, somewhere along the line, starting, I guess, in the 80s and then all the way through today. And I like the animated series version because he was a, 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 a crusader for justice and order. And it's only the, the circumstances of Gotham itself, the supervillains that are there, mm-hmm. the, the corrupt nature of society that requires him to act outside the law in order to uphold it. Yeah. Now you have a night interesting conflict in a character, right? Like Batman stands for order, stands for helping mm-hmm. others, stands for justice. But he sees that the best way to do that is to work outside the bonds of the law. Yeah. Bruce Wayne could have become a lawyer. He could have been like Harvey Dent, yeah. right? He could have easily been become like a DA or a prosecutor or something or a police chief. He could have been anything he wanted. Right. Chose to be a vigilante because of the specific society of Gotham. Well, and like you were saying earlier, what happens when those entrusted to uphold the law start breaking it? And that's what mm-hmm. Batman saw is the right. corrupt structures uh, of law in Gotham. Right. And you can't work through it. You've got to work around it. Right. So that this is why, and I, I think this, I think I see Batman as lawful good. Yeah. Batman might break the law as a vigilante, right? Yeah. He he puts people in traction. He puts them in the hospital. He's breaking and entering. He's visiting crime scenes when he's not supposed to. Mm-hmm. He's conducting illegal surveillance. Those are all breaking the law. But Batman does it in order to uphold a greater principle, which is order and justice, yeah. which transcends the law. Uh, and he does it presumably for good and altruistic reasons. He wants to make life better for the people in Gotham, as well as pursue this sort of personal vendetta that he has against sort of criminals in general. Mm-hmm. I see lawful good. I also like the fact because to me Joker is sort of a classic chaotic evil kind of character and the dichotomy between a lawful good, someone who's dark, they, have, they, they work in the shadows versus the Joker who's loud in your face, doesn't care who sees them, but also is chaotic and, and exactly. messy. Um, so I, that's why I lean more towards a, a lawful good uh, a Batman, although I know that there are people who are more like, well, he's maybe more chaotic uh, or something. Yeah, like yeah. And, and plus the, the eternal struggle between the Joker and Batman, him trying to get Batman to kill him and break his own personal break his code. Own, right, break his own personal but code. But the Joker who will kill anybody except for Batman. Right. Because that, he can't. He can't. He can't. That's, then his plaything is uh, ruined. Yeah, you can't break your mirror. He's not done looking at it yet. Right. Right? This will be, this will be interesting, <laughs> What about Rick? Oh, man. Rick Sanchez. Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty is, uh, I, they are, he's about as chaotic evil as you can get. Right? Uh, he casually destroys universes for, Galaxies, mo- for momentary universes. advantage. Uh, yeah. He, as routinely uh, proclaims how little and and shown how little he cares about the well-being and, uh, of others, I think the the way that he's portrayed in the TV show is a good is good proof that you can play a chaotic evil character that cares who, about who people. cares about people, but yeah. that care, that love, that attention is toxic. Yeah. You don't want someone like him caring about you. You don't want him being like, I want to be a part of your life yeah. because it's going to it's going to create chaos and disorder and ultimately harm yeah. for your own life. And I think the way they portray it in the show with the with the impact on the rest of Rick's family shows you what it's like to have someone in your family who would be chaotic evil along with unlimited power uh-huh. and the impact that would have. Either you have to become like him in order to survive yeah. or you break. And, and 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 you are left to pick up your own pieces. But yeah, I've seen some people say, well, he's more chaotic neutral because of the love he has for for Morty and the other members of his family. Yeah, but like, isn't that just self serving? I think Morty I see, is a meech, is a shield. I see it's very self serving. Yeah. and and the, the Rick Rick C one thirty seven at least, yeah, I see as uh, as chaotic evil. Yeah. yeah. Well, he is the most Rick of right. the Ricks. There always is. Yeah. Uh, but yes, that's that 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 love and attention that he desires. <laughs> is only, it's selfish. It's right. not like, he's not looking for a two-way street here. No, he no, just no. wants your attention. Watch your attention, uh, yeah. And, and so I, but he would never admit that to himself. Never admit that. And I think it's one of those things where it's like, if you, are, if you have a DM who is willing to let you play an evil character in an otherwise mixed alignment party or, or, or a non-evil party, then mm-hmm. you can say like, you know, I'm not always going to be out to screw over the players, but everything I do is selfish and that might inadvertently screw over the players, the other players. I I think it's it's a tough one. You have to be with a group that trusts each other, that's willing to kind of go there in yeah. terms of role playing purposes, um, and and not every group's willing to do that, which is why evil alignments are usually off limits. Right, right. But it is possible to make 
chaotic evil work Correct. in a setting. Correct, yeah. In terms of like media that I that I that I've seen that I like, forget the character's name, is it Mick Rory, Mick in, Rory. in both The Flash and then uh, Legends of Tomorrow, yeah. where he pretty clearly starts out chaotic evil. Well, what is Mick Rory? He wants to kill and steal. Well, he, he wants to burn things. And burn things, right. Yeah, he wants to burn things down and steal things. And steal things. Yeah. And and really resents any implication that he could be more than. Right. Or that or that there's a higher purpose to what he does. And I think over the course of the two seasons of Legend of Tomorrow that I've seen, he firmly goes from chaotic evil to chaotic neutral. Yes. And he's still part of the team. He's still a team player. Sees his survival as vital to the success of the team that he's on. And comes to see the people who are on that team as worthy of his respect and admiration. And most importantly, vice versa. And vice versa. And he proves himself a valuable and loyal member of the team eventually. There yeah. are those few moments where where uh, you know his loyalties are questioned. Yes. And I, I and sometimes rightly so and sometimes unfairly so. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're looking for an example of going of, of a character going from chaotic evil to chaotic neutral, I think it's a really well portrayed transition. I'm, I'm sure they didn't mean it to be that way, um, but I think it fits nicely into a chaotic evil to chaotic neutral transition. I mean, in just a broader sense, it's fun to think of what superhero or comic book or TV or movie characters, uh, what their alignments are, because it gives you a baseline, gives mm -hmm. you an example, something to draw inspiration from. It's not just there for internet arguments, which are fun and, and interesting sometimes. Hey, you know, and honestly yelling at people that you'll never meet and really have no consequence with, I, I get it. Right. I get it. I was, I was 15 once also. Right. It's worthwhile thinking about these things. And even if alignment plays no part in your game overall, yeah. and it's just a thing that's on your character sheet, thinking about your alignment and thinking like, okay, this is not, this isn't a straight jacket. This just is sort of a shorthand descriptor for how my character views the world and their place in it. And using these examples for media and, and what they offer for alignment purposes is just a fun way to kind of, I don't know, flesh out your character and, and make, uh, make the role playing of your game a little bit more richer huh. um, and, and make your character a bit, a bit more three dimensional. Yeah, because like you said, we haven't used it in forever and I still write my alignment on every character sheet. Sure. I, I think about it and I write it down and I take it into consideration when role playing. Yeah, yeah. And for the, the most part, that's all you need. Mm, I mean, this is one of those things where we get asked about it a lot, and it's kind of like, yeah. Did you get it? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. yes. Bitch. You got it on camera. Nice. Oh. Um. Excuse me. Oh. Did you see that whole thing <coughs> take place? Yes, buddy. That was amazing. <laughs> anyway. Homebrew magic item.